Dear friends, a blessed day to all. Thank you for tuning in to the very first episode of Chat with Chitra. I have always had this vision of creating a chat show which promotes unity through the arts and today I have made this dream a reality. We all have role models who influence our actions and guide us and motivate us. They strive to uncover our true potential and to help overcome our weaknesses. Joining me today is my role model. He is known for his passion, excellence in whatever he takes up, and for being a wonderful human being. I am very blessed and honored by the esteemed presence of my dear mentor, Dr. Paul Chandrasekharan Sabapatiji, CBO, CBE, Her Majesty's former Lord Lieutenant of the West Midlands. Please watch this video created by the Phoenix newspaper to know more about Dr. Sabapatiji and his achievements. Paul Sabapathy was born in Chennai, India on the 26th of September 1942 and went to the Lawrence School Lovedale and Madras Christian College. Paul's father worked for the Hindu newspaper, but in 1952, while Paul was in boarding school, he developed kidney problems and died while Paul was only nine years old. Paul's mother, a school teacher, promised his father that she would educate him abroad and in 1964 Paul came to the UK. At a time when 98% of BME people worked on the buses or in the factories, Paul went into higher education, achieving a distinction in HND Business Studies from Newcastle College of Commerce, which was also where he met his wife Wynne. Starting a master's degree at Aston University, he qualified as a Chartered Management Accountant and Chartered Global Management Accountant. Paul asked his professor while there to help him get a job in an accounts office, 150 clerks in the hall and he was the only brown face. This was to be a reoccurring situation throughout his life. Having applied for a management trainee role at IMI, he was interviewed by the finance director who told him he was the very first person of colour they were taking on, and depending on how well he did, would decide if they took on any more. No pressure then. Six years later, he was the youngest finance director in one of the largest subsidiaries of IMI at the age of just 31. Paul became a British citizen in 1984. He was transferred to IMI Titanium as assistant managing director before becoming acting managing director, turning the company around from losing 10 million a year to a 10 million profit before selling it for 200 million. Paul has also held positions as the first non-white president of the Chamber of Commerce and was on countless boards including the Black Country and Birmingham Heartlands Development Corporations. In 1995, Paul was awarded an OBE for his services to urban regeneration. It was at this time that he became the first non-white chief executive of the NHS on the 1st of July 1996. When he became chief executive of the NHS, he also joined the board at the then University of Central England, transforming the university during his time as chairman and leaving 85 million in the bank. In 2000, he retired from the NHS having turned the Birmingham East and North Primary Care Trust from a zero-star trust to the best in the country, and in 2004 he received a CBE for his work in higher education. In 2007, Paul's biggest surprise of all was that he was asked to be Lord Lieutenant of the West Midlands. Again, the first non-white person in the post. Paul has also received three honorary doctorates, attended Kate and William's wedding and the Queen's 60th anniversary celebrations. He's received a Jubilee Medal, a Lunar Society Medal for outstanding contribution to public life, he's flown in the Queen's helicopter, met all of the royals and even had to introduce the Pope to David Cameron as he was more senior than the Prime Minister at the time. Not bad for a boy from Chennai. Paul lost his wife last year after 48 years of marriage. When they married, she was given five years to live and told that she couldn't have children, but through God's grace and advances in medicine, Wynne received two kidney transplants and they had two children. John, who is a prize-winning medieval historian at UCL, who has two children of his own, and Hannah, who is a master's in textile design and a distinction from the Royal College of Art, who also has three children. Despite her illness, Wynne was a rock to Paul and he couldn't have done all the things he's done over the years without her looking after the home, the kids and even him. Humble as always, Paul stated, This country has been just fantastic to me and what I've been trying to do is give something back through service. To come to this country not knowing anyone, not even a friend of a friend of a friend and to be made Lord Lieutenant was mind blowing. Becoming Lord Lieutenant has meant a huge amount to me. I was very lucky to choose Birmingham. It's been so friendly and so welcoming. For his unwavering sense of duty and service across business, health, education and public service as Lord Lieutenant, as well as his commitment to connecting communities across the Commonwealth and beyond, the Phoenix newspaper awards Paul Sabapathy CBE with the Lifetime Achievement Award. We would like to invite the current Lord Lieutenant of the West Midlands, Mr John Crabtree OBE, to the stage to say a few words and present the award. Namaskar. 
Namaskaram ji. Uh, how Namaskaram. are you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. God's blessings, I'm fine. We all have role models and uh, people we are inspired by. I remember you told me you're greatly inspired by your mother. You mentioned that she's been the strongest influence in your life. What is it that you have taken from her? I think that um, uh, w women have played a very big part in my life. Uh, um, uh, for the first eight years of my life, uh, my grandmother played a very, very big role because my mother was a garment teacher mm -hmm. and in India every three months, every three years you got transferred. So when I was born, my mother was uh, three years, she was in uh, Tanjur, Tanjavur, mm -hmm. and then three years in, uh, at the palace school uh, in Tanjavur. Then she was in the garment girls school in, um, in Velo, mm -hmm. and then she came to Chennai. So, so for the first six years, my grandmother had greater influence on me. I lived with my father, my grandmother and grandfather. And then uh, my mother lived with me. I lived with my mother and father for two years. And then my mother again moved to a permanent job because uh, my father said it's ridiculous moving every three years. You better get a permanent job. So she got a gazetted posted job. Um, and she went to Lawrence School, Lovedale, one of the leading military boarding schools in uh, Uti. Mm. So I, I joined there as a scholarship holder. So uh, the biggest influence that my mother had was perhaps more in terms of uh, the two years she lived with us. Uh, in our family, uh, education has been very, very important. And also educating women. Uh, I'm very, very passionate about educating women. Because, um, you know, if you educate a man, you educate a man. If you educate a woman, you educate a family. And so uh, my uh, father's elder sister was a medical doctor. And uh, she came, she lived in Lalgudi, where your father's family come from. And, um, uh, and then my mother graduated in 1936 from Women's Christian College. So... She imbibed in me this great uh, uh, emphasis on education. She always said, wealth you can lose, but education you can't lose to the rest of your life. So uh, education was a big, big, uh, uh, important uh, feature in my, in my life. Uh, the other is, uh, uh, you know, aiming for excellence. Uh, she always said, aim for the stars and you'll fall on the top of the tree. And if you aim for the top of the tree, you'll fall on the floor. So again, you know, whatever you do, you do it well, because if it's worth doing, you do it well. And then she used to say to me, nobody died of hard work. And I think all of these was because I lost my father when I was nine. Oh, yeah. uh, my mother was only 35. And so, uh, so for her, um, you know, uh, this she wanted her son to succeed. So uh, excellence was another factor. And then she said, nobody died from hard work. And then she came to live with us. And every day she used to say to me, you're working too hard. You're working too hard. So I used to say to her, Mata, I said, no, you told me nobody died of hard work. So what are you complaining about? And so uh, hard work, uh, uh, value for education, uh, aiming high, um, and also uh, dedication, you know. Uh, she promised my father um, that she would educate me abroad. Uh, and then in 1957, uh, when I finished my uh, senior Cambridge, uh, and you had to go to pre-university, and uh, she therefore wanted to send me to the UK to study, but the Indian government would not give foreign exchange. So my mother said, if I can't send the foreign exchange, I would go myself abroad. So, you know, for an Indian woman to go to Africa on her own, uh, nearly, you know, uh, 70 odd years ago, 
was a big thing. And that was because she was educated. She was a very, very strong, determined, brave woman. And she sacrificed. She worked 20 years in Africa on her own, lived on her own. So I should come in here and study. So I think one of the things that for me stands out is the um, commitments and the sacrifices, you know, Tamil parents, I, and I imagine all Indian parents make for their children. Another thing that I've acquired from my mother is I'll be 78 this year. I'm always looking at how I can help people. I can definitely see uh, that you have inherited this wonderful trait from your mother. It's very, very inspiring. Thank you for uh, sharing this with us. I know that you love to, you go out of your way to help people. Uh, do you choose your mentees? Uh, what are the qualities uh, uh, that you expect from them? So what I look for in mentees is somebody who's passionate, who's determined and wants to make the world a better place. That's really what I'm interested in. Uh, and they need to, uh, you know, uh, I'm there to try and open doors, help them. Uh, because when I came here, you know, uh, 56 years ago, uh, I was on my own, there was no one to help me. Uh, I'm now in the fortunate position because of all the things I've done. I know so many people, so I can help. Amazing. I can definitely say that uh, your advice and guidance uh, has helped me to become a better and more responsible person than that I am. And I can't thank you enough for that, Jim. Thank you so much again. Now, you have started, you made a very humble start and you rose to very senior positions uh, in your life. How do you actually set or plan your goals? When I came, when I came to UK in 1964, um, I'd not, you know, I had a great time. I mean, I had a very good education. I did physics. I didn't really enjoy it. And then suddenly at the age of 21, I decided that my future looked bleak and I needed to, uh, to do what my mother told me. Uh, she always said, nobody died of hard work. I wasn't working hard. I was playing hard. I wasn't working hard. So suddenly I realized I had to change the play to, to work. So for me, uh, in everything I've done is I have a very, very simple principle. Is that whatever I do is to do the best. That's one of the values my mother taught me. And to do the best is to do it for the people you're serving. So um, I joined ICI as the first non-white management trainee. Uh, 50 odd years ago. I was the youngest finance director of the largest company of 31. And so when I was in business, all that mattered to me was making sure that the customer was at the heart of what we did. So we wanted the customer to have the best customer experience. So when you ask about what are my objectives, my objectives are all about what am I trying to do? What am I trying to do? Who am I serving? How can I give them the best possible outcome? Because if you do that, it makes them happy. You want a happy customer, you want a happy patient, you want a happy student. Because you've helped them to realize their goals. So that's really how I've always looked at things in terms of um, you know, trying to make the world a better place by serving the people that I'm serving, whether it's in business, whether it's in university, higher education, whether it's in health. Yeah, I, agree with you. I agree with you completely, Jim. It's a very important for us to be ambitious uh, with our goals. Uh, my daughter actually often says, go big or go home. And I couldn't agree more with you with that. Yeah, yeah. We are all humans. We all have our weaknesses. What would you say is your biggest weakness? Every strength can be a weakness. Right? Every strength can be a weakness. So, for example, I'm very determined. Mm -hmm. And to achieve anything, you have to be determined. You have to be persistent. You have to not give up. But the other side of that coin is that you can be stubborn. Mm -hmm. You can be pig-headed. 
Mm. So you need to be able to be flexible and willing to change. If the facts change, you change. But we have this feeling at the moment is that you take a position and you're not allowed to change. Then you call it a U-turn. There's nothing wrong in U-turns. Mm. If the facts change, you change. All that matters is the outcome. You know, people are more interested in the process. People are more interested in, you know, they're trying to project. Everyone is perfect. But I would say my big, if, if I had a, a failing, it's my, is my determination. And that stems from uh, my school, uh, where I went to, and uh, Sir Henry Lawrence, he died in the siege of Lucknow during Indian independence in 1857. Mm -hmm. And his last words were never given because he came from London Derry in Northern Ireland where they used to have fights between the Protestants and the Catholics. And the motto of London Derry was never surrender. So his last words were, no, you know, never given. So everybody that I meet from my school were all very determined guys. We're always, will not give up. Uh, we want to succeed, but sometimes there's a danger that sometimes we don't think, look, you know, the facts have changed, and so we need to change. So uh, that, I think, would be my perhaps my greatest uh, failing, because I'm so determined to succeed. Yeah, I can definitely see the determination to succeed is what has made you a person that you are with, you know, with such high positions and uh, all the honors you have received, all the national honors you have received, have received so far. Now, you are an incredibly accomplished individual and you have received so many national honors. What do these titles mean to you? How did you feel uh, to be awarded an OBE, a CBE, a CBO by Her Majesty the Queen? I think the, the thing is with all these, the things with honors is that it's a recognition. It's nice to be recognized. You know, it's nice when somebody, you do something, you're not expecting thanks, but if somebody thanks you, you feel good. So I think that when you get these honors, it is uh, telling you that you're on the right path. It tells you that you should, you're going on the right path and you should do more and better. So it is encouragement, but I have never ever set out to receive an honor. But for me, one of the greatest achievements uh, for me that is, besides all the national honors has been amazing, but uh, getting an honor to be made, to be elected as deputy chairman of all the British universities, because I'm the first non-white chairman of a British university in 2001, you know, 19 years ago. Mm. And it's always uh, something special when your, you know, your colleagues, people who are doing that job, think you're good enough to become vice president, you know, deputy uh, chairman of all the universities, so it's not only England, but Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, to be elected deputy chairman by all the other chairmen. Right is for me because that is very special because they know what it means they know you and it's not an honor from somebody above it's from your fellows and so if i go to a meeting of chairman of british universities i'm the only non-white person if i go to a meeting of lord lieutenants i was the only non-white person so uh, very true. I, I'm sure uh, you, your journey, your experience, and the way how you have uh, molded each of your uh, mentees uh, itself uh, is, a, is a huge uh, uh, success because all of us have become much better individuals than what we were. And uh, it has given us more of a focus and uh, you have instilled so much of confidence in us to and motivated us to do more of the, the work which we do and in a, in a proper way. 
uh, and I'm sure the viewers uh, who are listening to your uh, inspiring speech will get also further motivated to talk about their, uh, their uh, things they have done, uh, all the good achievements, accomplishments they have done uh, in their life so far. There might have been times in your life where you must have felt quite low, uh, which negatively would have impacted your plans. How did you motivate yourself in such times? Well, I think the thing is that uh, what you need to do is uh, life is never a bed of roses. You know, everyone thinks that if you, for example, if you're in business, mm. things will be going fantastically well, mm. but then it will go bad. Mm. And then things will be bad and people think they'll be not get better. So I say to people, you know, when the sun is shining, don't think the sun will always be shining. The rain will come. And when it's raining, don't think it will always be raining. The sun will come. And what COVID has done yeah. is it's shown how many people have not been prepared for things going wrong. Yeah. And so for me, uh, getting to 21, uh, realizing the future was bleak with the third class physics degree, uh, I was going to go nowhere. And in my life, I've had setbacks. But every setback, you make mistakes. And every mistake has some learning in it. Has some learning in it. I, because um, I was one of the first non-white chief executives in the NHS. Because I was a chief executive in the NHS 24 years ago non-white chief exec in the NHS 24 years ago. And I had to go to University of Warwick to talk to senior black and ethnic minority managers to, who are aspiring to become directors. And, um, and I was saying to them that the, one of the things is that very often when we don't succeed, yeah. we blame someone else for it. So, so if you're black and ethnic minority and you don't get a job, or if you're a woman, you don't get a job, you say it's the system. It could be the system. I'm not saying it's not the system. It could be the system. And you could be a really good candidate, mm. but all you need is one candidate better than you. You just need one person better than you. So you might be, you might be very good, but the other person is excellent, yeah. right? Or you might be good and the other person is very good. So sometimes what you need to do is ask yourself, why is there something I need to do to get better? Mm. So sometimes there's a danger of when something goes wrong, of not having introspection. Mm. So I always have introspection. I always try to see. Mm. Why did I fail? What did I do wrong? Right? And then learn from it. So experience is all about failure. So when you say, how have I done it? It's just that I've really, I don't try to blame anyone else. You know, uh, I am the author of my own misfortunes. If I had something's gone wrong, it's my fault. If you need to look at yourself and get to the truth about it, uh, it's very it's easy to say, it's very difficult to do, it's not at all easy, uh, but I think to, if you are going to succeed, you need to have a certain amount of introspection, you need to be able to look at yourself and say this is where I'm weak. And also this the other thing is, everyone thinks, everyone thinks um, you have to be brilliant at everything, right? It's not possible. It's not possible. So what you do is you play to your strengths. You know what your strengths are. And then you get on your team. People are good at other things. So it's a team effort. So, um, so again, if you are, uh, you know, 
a very good um, administrator, mm. then you need other people who are good at other things. So you you can't be good at everything. So again, this is again one of the things about failing is that people you've got to be perfection. If you're perfection, you'll be God. None of us can be perfect. So again, we need to be able to sort of say, well, I'm good at these things, but I'm not good at the other things. If I'm going to get the best possible thing for the student because I'm in the uh, higher education or teaching, or if I'm in the health service and I want the best outcome for the uh, uh, patients, or if I'm in business, I want the best things for the customer, then you've got to see where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses, and you try to get others to help you to cover your weaknesses. So together, collectively, we can get the best outcome. And we also need God's blessings along with our own hard work. And yeah, but you see, this is the other thing is, you, you know, I always say to young people, to succeed, you need two things. You need preparation and you need opportunity. Right? The only thing within your control is preparation. Right? So always be prepared. Work hard. Get, the, get all the skills. Try everything out. Find out what you... You know, I'm 78. I'm still learning. Right? You never stop learning. So you, you can do preparation. If you're a believer like me, the opportunity comes from God's grace, God's gift. If you're a non-believer, it's luck, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, and when opportunity meets preparation, you have success. So if the opportunity comes mm -hmm. and you haven't done the preparation, you can't succeed. Yeah. Very often you have done the preparation that the opportunity doesn't come. And that is again, one of the reasons I said earlier is that the world has, everyone's got a problem. Everyone has a problem. They want solution to problems. So if you can show that you can provide solutions to the problem, you will succeed. And that is why if you're very good and nobody knows you're very good, nobody's going to come to you. So that's just one of the reasons. It's not a question of boasting. It's about doing good job and letting people know you can do a good job. So the, actually the opportunities come your way. So you create opportunities. So I think it's a question of, uh, uh, you know, uh, going the extra mile and standing out. Yeah, I've always been inspired by uh, your uh experiences so which you have shared with me that actually inspires me and motivates me to uh, you know it, it brings me back in focus how do you actually define your happiness my happiness is really focused on the happiness of the people I'm serving so my focus my happiness comes out of the happiness of other people and what I hope is that every time I uh, relate to somebody, I come away with a positive experience. Uh, but one of the things I re always remember, my father was a lovely, lovely man, very God-fearing man. He was always on his knees every day praying. And uh, he said to me, when he said to me, whenever you meet somebody, always be nice to them because that might be the first and last and only time you meet them. And the only impression they'll have of you is that of first occasion. So whenever you meet somebody for the first time, make sure they go away with a favorable experience. Very, very inspiring. What is it that you are not most grateful for today? Um, I think I'm most grateful for the family I was born in, I was born in a Tamil Christian family, very, uh, very, very uh, committed. Mm. And my values are all from that, um, from my mother, my grandmother, my father. Mm. It is all about 
helping others less fortunate. So I was very fortunate in where I was born. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story which your listeners might be interested in. Uh, uh, I was 19 years old and I was in Madras Christian College and uh, if any of your listeners are from Chennai, they will recognize the place. Um, it was in Paris Corner, opposite the High Court in Chennai. Mm -hmm. And opposite the High Court in Chennai, on the other side of the road, where the Paris building used to be, uh, was Ramakrishna Lunch Home. It was uh, in those days, three years ago, I don't know if it still exists. In those days, it was a famous uh, South Indian vegetarian restaurant. And uh, people used to eat off the banana leaves and then throw the, the remainder of the banana leaves and the leftover food into huge concrete bins in the front of the restaurant. And into the bins were urchin boys and uh, dogs fighting for the food. And suddenly it occurred to me that if I had been born in the slum, yeah. I would be with those boys fighting for that food. I was 19 years old. I'll be 78 this year, so it's, you know, uh, 60 years. And that has changed my approach to life. Every day I say that because of the bed I was born, I am what I am. If I'd been born in the slum, if I'd been born in a very, very poor family, mm -hmm. If I'd be born in a family which was not loving, not caring, then I would be struggling. So I think where you're born, all of us need to be thankful for where we are born and for our parents and for our bringing. And so we have a responsibility for all those who are not fortunate to be born in those circumstances. So I would say I'm very, you know, that is a big part of it. Uh, the other thing is I had a wonderful wife, uh, so I could not have done all the things I did without uh, my wife. So actually, the people who have had, the individuals who had the greatest influence in my life are the women. First my grandmother, Amachi, then my mother, and then my wife. So, um, so when they say that people I've never known of a weak Indian woman. I only know strong ones. Although, although my, my wife was English. Yeah. So very inspiring. And uh, I'm sure even our viewers will find it very motivating uh, to hear your life experiences. And yes, it's women power. So things are changing. The perspectives about women are also changing. And it's uh, moving towards uh, the right direction as it should be. Um, we now come to the end of the first segment. The second one is called, something called the lighter side of you. So these are just one word answers. The most beautiful place you have ever been. The, the most wonderful place I've ever been to is Xi'an in China. China, okay. To see the, the warriors, you know, which were made 2000 years ago. If you were an animal, what animal would you be and why? Uh, I think that I would be a, uh, ant because it works hard. It helps others. It carries well above its weight. And uh, it is, uh, it's focused on working together. Right. What is the song that you hear most often? Uh, I think, uh, I, I would say Amazing Grace. What is better, being organized or attention to details? I can't see achieving success without both. And I think being an accountant, mm. uh, the devil's in the detail. Mm. And so you can be organized, mm. 
but if you don't attend to the detail, it doesn't work. Uh, my own focus is outcome, and you need both. I don't think you can, if you're not organized, you won't get the outcome. Yeah. If you don't attend to the detail, you can't get to it. Because, uh, you know, if you don't have just uh, one bit, you know, you've got a machine, if you haven't got one screw, the whole machine can't work. So you need to attend the details. So I'm sorry, I can't say one or the other. I think because I'm focused on outcomes, I think you need to be organized and you need to have attention to detail. Sure, okay. How would you describe yourself in three words? Uh, big. Talkative and caring. Amazing. So that brings us to the end of this uh, wonderful, inspiring interview. I can't thank you enough, Jay, for your valuable time, your guidance, your love, your support. Uh, I would like to um, thank you for your continued support and guidance as my mentor. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you and God bless and God bless all your efforts. Uh, and um, what I like is your passion and enthusiasm and, uh, you know, and all the sacrifices that Ram and children have to make for your passion. So they have to be congratulated because without their support, you won't achieve all the things you've achieved. Very good. Very good. Mm? Thank you. So God bless you and uh, everything that you do. And may these programs be a success. Thank you. God Thank bless. You so much. Thank you so much.